yes ma'am sir good to go we can start okay good evening everyone a uh, very warm welcome to dr pascal and uh, he has been kind enough to uh, accept our invitation for our series of uh, international webinars and uh, he is a very well known he is a very well known uh, figure in the field of implantology and uh, he is a faculty of the university of uh, corsica and um, we have with us the moderator dr uh, hs grover the secretary of the indian society of periodontology i welcome all of you i welcome the delegates who have been consistently uh, giving support and uh, uh, have participated in good numbers in all the uh, all the ventures that isp took this year or the last year and i hope this covid goes away soon and we can have some physical meetings and one of these Uh, meetings we can ask dr pascal to come here and uh, deliver the lecture in a physical mode over to dr hs grover thank you very much uh, president ma'am uh, very uh, good evening to all the delegates and a special you know good afternoon to dr pascal valentini our esteemed uh, guest uh, speaker for the day uh, as you all are aware that uh, it is our president ma'am's vision that uh, you know has been uh, fructified into international webinar series and we've had many accomplished speakers uh, in coming to attend those series and today uh, we have uh, with us another distinguished uh, professor uh, dr pascal so before i introduce uh, the achievements of dr pascal i would uh, like to uh read out the abstract of uh, today's topic uh today's topic is maxillary sinus grafting with lateral approach prevention and management of complications today the lateral approach for maxillary sinus grafting has become a routine technique with an implant survival rate over 96% in the maxillary posterior region however this technique may be associated with some complications that may influence long term implant survival rate sinus complications can be classified in two categories intraoperative complications and postoperative complications intraoperative complications include damage of the alveolar anterior artery and perforation of the <clears throat> sinus membrane and others their occurrence is conversely proportional to the surgeon's skill and have no influence on implant survival if they are properly managed on the other hand post operative complications include infections that occur in the form of chronic or acute sinusitis their frequency ranges from 3% to 5% according to the literature and they can result from an inadequate management of perioperative complications or from a poor evaluation of maxillary sinus particularities however in both cases they can induce severe consequences uh, so uh, i have introduced the topic now i have the privilege of uh, introducing dr pascal valentini sir has done dds from the university of paris in 1982 since 1996 he is program director post graduate of oral implantology university of corsica which is there in cote france since 1996 associate professor department of restorative dentistry in university of loma linda usa sir has been president of the european association of uh, association for osseo integration or the very famous eao from 2012 to 2014 he is a international speaker and author of multiple papers in the field of bone regeneration and maxillary sinus grafting presently his private practice is limited to implant dentistry only and he is practicing in paris thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation and as the say the field is yours now <laughs> 
So thank you so much, Dr. Broger, for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the Indian Period, Period Society for the kind invitation. It's really an honor for me to share my experience in the field of sinus grafting and especially the management of complications with you this afternoon. So we will have uh, a course a lecture will be, which would be one hour and a half long. Be, be free to ask all the questions you want to ask through the Dr. Grover, he will uh, send me the questions. And let's start right now. Let me share my, my screen. Okay. Uh, okay, that's perfect. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Grover told you, uh, maxillary sinus grafting is a predictable uh, way to place implant in the posterior maxilla, especially when we are using the lateral approach. So what would be our uh, choice for placing implants in the posterior maxilla in case of uh, atrophic, in case of missing bone? According to the bone height below the sinus, we have two, two ways to place implants. In case we have at least four to five millimeters, we will go to the use to using the short implants, even if we have to penetrate the sinus cavity of two to three millimeters without any adverse effects. And in case we have less than this value of remaining bone height, we will choose the lateral approach, which was described in early in the 80s by Bon and James from Loma Linda University in California. Of course, the indication is for a sinus grafting procedure with the lateral approach is when we have a normal interarch space. In case of augmented interarch space, we will go to choose some external uh, bone augmentation, for example, guided bone regeneration or bone graft uh, procedure. As you know, the lateral approach is the most documented in the literature because it was described, as I already told you, 40 years ago by Bonin and James and Il Tatum. And they suggested to use the, 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 this technique in two different ways according to the remaining bone below the sinus. In case the remaining bone is less than four to five millimeter, we will choose the two-stage approach because the primary stability will not be enough to get to place the implant at the same time we place the graft. Or in case we have more than four to five, it will be possible to get primary stability for the implants. And in that situation, we'll place both together. Uh, our favorite uh, grafting material is xenograft, especially bovine bone. We have been using it for more than 30 years right now with a good, very good results. Of course, if we look at the literature, especially the systematic reviews, we have two different kinds of systematic reviews. The old one from the, the early 2000 and the more recent one for from um, around two, uh, 2018 to 2019. And if we compare the implant survival rate provided by those uh, systematic reviews, you can see that for the whole one, the implant survival rate after, right, after five years is around 92%. And it is much better for the recent one. It is around 95 to 96%. Why? Because during this time, we have been interested in how to manage complication in order to improve the implant survival rate. Those complications, all of, all of them, you can see on this slide, can be avoided or can be managed in a very efficient way. That's the topic of my lecture this afternoon. Every time we have a complication, we have to ask ourselves two questions. Why did I get this complication? How could I, could I avoid this complication? In trying to, to answer those questions, we will for sure find the right strategy to avoid them. 
we have two different kinds of complications leading all of them to infection. We have intraoperative complications and postoperative complications. So today we will have two different parts of my lecture, the, pre the prevention and the management of intraoperative complications and the same for postoperative complications. Both, all the intraoperative complications can lead to postoperative complications. This is an evidence. The first one, the first intraoperative complication we can have to manage is a vascular damage due to the lesion of the intra in the alpha the, the alveolar intral artery, which is an anastomosis in between the infraorbital artery and the posterior superior alveolar artery. We will get for sure the complication, I mean the profuse bleeding during the surgery, when this artery has an intrabonic passage, as you can see here on this cross-sectional cut. And the prevalence is much higher when the diameter of the alveolar artery is more than two millimeters, which is about 20% of the cases. And we will have a profuse bleeding also for patients who has, who has are um, uh, treated with anticoagulants and antiplatelet medicines or patient with high blood pressure. So how do we have to manage this complication? We can choose to use electrocoagulation in order to be able to continue the surgery. But in that case, the risk is to damage the uh, sinus membrane using, using this kind of device. Another way to manage the bleeding is to use surgical wax or tranexamic acid. But as with surgical wax, for example, in this nice video I got from my friend, Dr. Testori from Italy, the risk is that we can get some postoperative infection using these surgical wax. Another way to um, manage the bleeding, the intraoperative bleeding, is to use some clamp. And with those, those clamps, it's possible to crush the artery. But the risk with crushing and the use of tranexamic acid, for example, is the recurrence of postoperative bleeding. We will have different kinds of complications. For example, we can get some granular loss through the interior, anterior releasing incision and the very bad quality of the, of the graft. For example, in that case, we have a big lacuna in the center of the graft and there will be, it will be need, uh, necessary to regraft at the time we're going to place the implant. Another complication which can occur is an hemosinus, which can result in a, an acute sinus infection. I would like to show you a, a case we got in uh, our program in Corsica. This patient underwent a sinus surgery and this patient was presenting um, a bleeding during the surgery. And it, we, we treated it with uh, tranexamic acid. And after the surgery, uh, we do, 10 days after the surgery, this patient came back to us with a pain on the um, left side and uh, an edema. Every time we have a, a complication, we the first thing we ask the patient to do is a CBCT in order to identify the complication and choose the right strategy to manage it. So in that case, you can see on the actual cut here on the side of the left sinus, you can see the clot, which is a bit large. So in that case, what we do, we have to drain it using a syringe in order to eliminate the blood which can which will be could be able to be infected and by doing this we will prevent the infection and it we will get a very good healing on the previously um, affected area by the the, the clot
Of course, the best way is to avoid, to prevent the artery bleeding. And in order to prevent the artery bleeding, the only way is to dissect the alveolo-antral artery, as you can see on those videos, using piezosurgery. By using piezosurgery, we can isolate the artery. By isolating the, the artery, we are, we are able to graft around the artery without any damage for this vessel. This is the way we manage the, um, the alveolo-antral artery. The second very important complication is the sinus membrane perforation, which can lead to infection. Of course, according to this paper, we can see that because of the risk of granule loss through the perforation and the infection of it leading to the infection of the sinus, the implant survival rate will decrease in case of mismanagement of those perforations. Why do we have perforation? For example, because when we are using a specific technique as this technique, which is called the window repositioning technique, consisting in removing the buckle plate, detaching it from the, the sinus membrane, we will have a big tearing. And in order to avoid this, we prefer to erode the lateral wall using piezosurgery, which is a much softer approach. And by doing this, we go tangentially to the membrane. We can prevent any damage for this membrane. And by doing this, we are able also to identify, uh, to minimize the size of the perforations, according to the literature. Why do we have uh, uh, perforations? The first parameter, which is a risk factor for uh, perforation, is the membrane thickness. We will discuss this issue a little bit later. Or in case we have a very complex internal anatomy with septa in different directions, with different sizes, and many septas. And another reason why we can have those this complication is a specific anatomy for the sinus, especially when we have very narrow sinuses. Regarding the thickness, if we look at the literature, the prevalence of uh, membrane perforation is not limited to very thin membrane. If we look at this paper, the most dangerous um, thickness is less than one millimeter and more than one and a half millimeter. The most resistant membrane is around one to one and a half millimeter of thickness. And you can see that the thickness, in case the membrane is very thick, is not the guarantee for the absence of perforations, as we had here. So the most predictable thickness to prevent the membrane perforation is around one to one and a half millimeter. But looking at the pre-op CBCT, which is absolutely mandatory, it is impossible to predict the exact thickness of the membrane and the capacity for it to resist to the dissection and to the, to, to the perforation. Another problem is the septa. And especially when we have very complex anatomy, the best way to understand the anatomy and to implement the right strategy is to have the patient to undergo a CBCT and especially with a 3D reconstruction in order to know exactly how the anatomy is. And I would like to present you a very nice um, way to prevent, manage perforation due to a very complex internal anatomy. But with this very nice paper coming from Japan, as you can see here on the baseline, we have a very complex anatomy, internal anatomy, especially with this kind of septa, very complex anatomy for the, this medial septa. As you can see here, we have a little um, 
a little hole, a little cavity, which is very difficult to detach the membrane from this specific uh, bone um, uh, uh, structure. In that case, what we it is suggested to do is to open a window and to that to remove this septum here. The septum is removed, and of course, this will result in a very important uh, membrane perforation, but it's not an issue. After the, the septum has been removed, the site is completely closed and six months post after the first surgery, we can go back to the, this, situ this area. And thanks to this period of healing, we will get some scar tissue here, making possible the, the sinus membrane uh, dissection without any tearings because the membrane is much more resistant. And in that situation, we will be able to place now a new implant, an implant with the grafting material. And it is very important to know this uh, mechanism and we will discuss this mechanism in details later. Another parameter to be considered is the sinus anatomy, especially the width of the sinus, and especially the angle in between the buccal plate and the palatal plate here. This angle is called the angle A. This parameter has been described um, a few, maybe 20 years ago in New York. And according to the value of A, the membrane perforation uh, percentage is different. For example, here, in case A is less than 30 degrees, as you can see here, the prevalence of perforation is more than 60 degrees. When A is in between 30 and 60, the prevalence of perforation is around 28. And finally, when A is more than 60 degrees, we don't have any perforation. Of course, this is valid in case of very flat sinus floor and the absence of septa. What is the influence of this on the surgical technique? But first we have to consider another parameter. It is the sinus shape. Here on this slide, you have two different shapes for the sinus. On the left, you have a perfect triangle and on the right, we have a triangle, but with a narrow anterior recess. And if we look at this shape with the narrow anterior recess, according to the paper I was quoting just before, we have to think about the position of the window in order to prevent the perforations. So, in that situation here with the narrow anterior recess, if we look at the anterior part of the sinus, A in this area is less than 30 degrees. Immediately posterior, it is in between 30 and 60. And in the back, it is more than 60. That means that the most dangerous area is the anterior one. Imagine we place our window in that position. Of course, if we place the window in the middle of the buckle plate here, we will have to dissect the anterior area in yellow blindly. By doing this blindly, the risk, because A is less than 30 degrees, the, the risk of undetected perforation is very high, as we did here. For example, this part has been dissected that blindly because the window was very posterior. And when we remove this bone, the back of bone here anteriorly, we will detect this, this perforation. That means that in order to prevent this, we have to be able to dissect this area, this, this area in direct view in order to prevent the perforation. That means that this window is in the wrong position. The, window has to be very anterior, as close as possible, the anterior wall of the sinus. Of course, it is very difficult to detect the, uh, um, the perforation. And we know 
according to many papers that the Vas Vaslava uh, maneuver is not very uh, effective in detecting the perforations. As you can see here, we have two perforations, very large perforation on the right, and the membrane is still moving when the patient is breathing. So we have to be very uh, careful with in, in using the Valsava maneuver to detect the membrane perforations. How do we have to manage those perforations? Most of the time, the perforation is not visible in the entirely. We can see only part of it. In order to manage the perforation first, we have to modify the osteotomy in order to see the complete, the entire uh, uh, perforation by extending the osteotomy, for example, here anteriorly. Once the perforation is visible completely, we have to detach the membrane, but we have to go opposite to the perforation. Here, the, the perforation is anterior. So in order to dissect the membrane and to do not increase the size of the perforation, we have to go distal. By going distal, we are taking advantage of the, uh, the membrane arm elasticity in order to reduce the size of the perforation. But of course, the perforation is not visible anymore, but doesn't, this doesn't mean that the, the perforation is absent. Of course, we have to be sure the granule will not go through the perforations. For this, we have to seal the perforation with the membrane. But according to this paper, you can see that even using a, a resorbable membrane, the, the prevalence of, of infection is more than 30 degrees. Why? 30%, sorry. Because we are using the membrane in the wrong way. So what is the best way to use the membrane in order to prevent the complication caused by the uh, the graph material migration through the perforation. This is a drawing showing the perforation here. It is suggested by the literature to use the membrane. If we place the membrane like this, above, entirely into the sinus, above the perforation, at the time we're going to inject the, mature, the grafting material with a syringe, the risk is to move the membrane away from the perforation, opening the, the, the space for the granule to move, to migrate into the sinus. So we have to think about the technique making possible the stability of the membrane. So it is possible by using these techniques suggested by Dr. Prusaev and Lozada from Malinda, what they are, they are suggesting is to use the membrane in that way, leaving part of the membrane outside, fixing it with a titanium pin in order to be sure the membrane, which is inside the sinus, will not move away from the perforation when injecting the gravity material. That's exactly what we do here. We assure the membrane will not move at the time we're going to place the grafting material. So this technique is valid when the, the, the perforation is external or in the middle of the sinus. But in case we have this kind of anatomical parameter, which is angle B, the angle B is in between the palatal aspect of the, mid, the nasal wall and the nasal wall here. In case B is acute, the risk of perforation is very high. And in case we have a perforation like due to this acute angle, this perforation will be adjacent to the medial wall. If we place the membrane the same way as we did before, this area will not close. And when we are going to inject the material, we will have some granule loss internally. So in order to prevent this, 
we have suggested the following technique, which is called the Titan technique, in order to prevent this situation. So the technique is the following. In order to close, to make this um, area completely hermetical, completely closed, we place the membrane like this. And we pin the membrane in the medial wall and externally in order to rebuild a new roof for the graft. You can see here the titanium pins within the, um, the sinus in the medial wall here. I show you the, the video. Here we have two big tearing for the, side, the membrane and the internal one is very, very large. In order to close it, you have to fold to detach the membrane completely, to trim the membrane, the collagen membrane, according to the size of the perforation. We fold it and we push it in with um, a specific instrument. And then we tack it in the medial wall using titanium pins. By doing this, we can rebuild completely the roof for the, of the graft. And once the membrane is completely stabilized internally and externally, we can graft this area without any risk of granular loss through the internal perforation. This is the, the, the outcome. And now if we look at the X-ray, this is the, the post-op X-ray, and this is the five-year outcome. This is another case here. After five years, you can see here the on the CBCT, we have the, the, the pins within the medial wall. Of course, it is possible also to, to seal the um, perforation using PRF membranes, but the risk is the, the membrane is very mobile and it can move away from the perforation. So it is much, much less predictable than the, the stabilized um, collagen membrane. In case of large perforations, we have to proceed in a different way. This will occur in 10% of the cases. We have the, the membrane, which is looking like lace, it is completely destroyed. So in that case, we have to abort the surgery. And this CBCT was performed immediately after the, the tearing, the big tearing. You can see that immediately after the surgery, we have a sinus membrane edema, which is the first step of the healing process. So at that, at that moment, we have to close the flap completely without placing any membrane here in between the, the flap and the window. Why? Because we have to make possible the healing process. The healing process is coming from two different origins. First, the inflammation of the membrane from the inside. And second, from the periosteum externally. Both mechanism will, will merge together in order to produce after two to four months a scar, some scar tissue here. At that moment, we are able to go back to the patient using a split thickness incision buckley in order to divide, to separate the scar tissue from the internal aspect of the flap by doing this, here you can see, this is the, the, the scar tissue. We have to divide it using a blade, leaving some periosteum attached to the membrane, to the sinus membrane, in order to make it much more resistant. This is the, the dissection with a 15C blade in order to isolate here the scar tissue. This is the scar tissue, very thick, very resistant. At that moment, it is very easy to detach it without any risk of perforation because of the thickness and the, the, 
the re resistant scar tissue, and we can graft the area in a very predictable way. Those are the most uh, frequent complication we can uh, encounter with this technique. Of course, we have some more um, uh, complication, but we have no time to describe all of them, but those are the most common. Let's go now to the post-operative complications. According to the literature, post-operative complications will represent about three to 5% of, of the cases. Of course, it's not a lot, but sometimes it could be, those complications could be very serious. For example, here, this is a patient who presented a very huge oral fistula secondary to sinusitis. Another one, this is an acute sinusitis, uh, which is occurring around one month after the surgery. Here we have an osteonecrosis. And finally, a very uh, not well-known complication, it is sinusitis due to perimplantitis. And we will discuss this issue in details later. Of course, we have to be able to detect those patients with a risk of postoperative complication. And those patients, they have predisposition for complication. So our job as a clinician is to be able to detect those predispositions. For this, as we have suggested a few years ago in this paper, we have to implement a specific strategy for this. This strategy, strategy consists, consists in asking ourselves two questions. First question, is the maxillary sinus healthy or unhealthy? Before the procedure, of course. And the second question we have to ask ourselves is, is there any infection risk because of post-surgical alteration of sinus physiology? Let's try to answer those questions. First, is the maxillary sinus unhealthy? Maxillary sinus is unhealthy in case of, of course, pre-existing sinus pathology and because of a dental pathology. Which are the pre-existing sinus pathology which are susceptible to induce postoperative complications. If we look at this paper coming from the uh, from ENTs, those ENTs are um, examine, uh, are, uh, um, are um, examining uh, people who are um, candidates for sinus fraud evasion. And they have listed different pathologies which are susceptible to induce postoperative complications. If we look at this graph, most of the, the, the pathologies which are at risk for postoperative infection are related to the osteum. What is the osteum? The osteum is the anatomical structure which allows the sinus drainage. This is the osteum. It is the infundibulum here and the middle meatus. And the opening of the infundibulum in the, in the sinus is called the osteum. This complex is called the com osteomeatal complex. But in order to be much rapid, we will ask him, we'll uh, call this structure osteum. This osteum can be open or completely closed. And the first thing we have to do when we are planning a sinus graft surgery is to check the osteum patency using a CBCT. The problem is then when the osteum is blocked, as you can see on this drawing. We have different pathologies for this corresponding to this complete closure. What should we do in that situation? 
Of course, in that situation, we have to collaborate with the NT by referring the patient to him in order to decide what is the best way to reestablish sinus patency and, of course, the, the physiological drainage. Here we have two different situations. On the upper uh, image, you can see on the right sinus, you can see an acute sinusitis. The sinus is completely infected and the osteum here is completely closed. And in the lower image, this is a bilateral inflammation called polyposis. The result is exactly the same. In, for the polyposis situation, both osteoms are completely blocked. So it is impossible in those situations to perform the sinus graft. So in that situation, we refer the patient to the NT and he will decide the best strategy to reestablish the osteopathy. He will decide, for example, to make, perform an entrostomy here by removing first the middle turbinate and then opening the osteum, which is completely closed. For the polyposis, it will use this aspiration device in order to remove all the granulation tissue in order to reestablish a perfect patency and the perfect drainage for the sinus. Once those surgeries have been performed, we have to wait for the green light from the ENT for us to perform our surgery. You can see here for the previously affected um, sinus with the uh, acute sinusitis, this, the sinus is completely clean. The osteum is completely open. Same thing for the polyposis case. Those contraindications are relative contraindications because we can manage them. Another um, situation is a chronic sinusitis. When we see this kind of image, we have to be very careful because that means that the membrane is very thick, but very, very fragile. It is a kind of jelly. And when you touch it, for sure, you destroy completely the membrane. So in that case, it is much better to refer the patient to the NT in order for him to manage this pathology before our surgery. This is also a relative contraindication. Unfortunately, we have absolute contraindication as this one. This one is called a, an inverted papilloma. It is a benign sinus membrane tumor. And you can see here, the osteum is completely blocked. If we have the, the ENT to remove this tumor, the risk of cancer degeneration is very high. So that means that this situation is an absolute contraindication. It's much better to do not manage this, to do not accept this, this patient to be grafted. The second reason why the sinus could be unhealthy is because of a dental pathology. Here on this CBCT, you can see an acute sinusitis because of endoperio problems in the region of the premolar and the molar. And we have an infection of the sinus ear. What should we do in that situation? Imagine we remove those teeth. The risk is to have in a road trial communication. Why? Because we did not check first the osteum patency. And in that situation, the osteum was completely blocked. And because of the blockage of the osteum, it was not possible for the infection to be drained. The only way for the drainage was through the, the alveolar socket. And this is the reason why we got an oral trial communication. So, in case of acute sinusitis, because of dental problems, first we have to check the osteum patency. In case the osteum is completely blocked, don't try to extract the teeth. What we have to do is to refer the patient to the NT, as you can see here, this is an acute sinusitis. Because of this dental problem, 
Before the extraction of this, we will refer the patient to the NT. The NT will perform an antrostomy in order to reestablish the sinus drainage. And only after this, we are allowed to remove the causal tooth, as we will do here. Here, the causal tooth is removed and the apical lesion is completely curtailed and we don't have any more infection now. And now you can see, we don't have any more infection and no oral trial communication. So please first check the osteopathy before extracting the causal teeth. Now, the second question we have to ask ourselves, is there an infection risk because of post surgical alteration of sinus physiology? We have several reasons for this. First, dental reasons. Here we have some endopace remnant within the sinus cavity. In case we graft this area, the risk is to get an aspergillosis as we did here. So in order to prevent this, the best thing to do is everything we, every time we have this kind of endopaste remnant within the, the sinus cavity, we have to re, refer the patient to the NT in order for him to remove it, this endopaste remnant before we perform the surgery. And right now there is no more risk to get any aspergillosis. Another reason why we can have sinus infection for dental reason is periplantitis. Is we have a, a periplantitis in an around an implant which was play, which was placed in a grafted sinus because here we have some period problems which has not which have not been managed before the the implant placement. And this will result in two different situations, a huge bone defect around the implant without any sinus infection or a huge defect with sinus infection. So how do we have to manage those situations? Of course, those periplantitis occurs not only with biomaterials, but also with autogenous bone, as you can see on this case. This was only autogenous. So let's go to look how to manage the periplantitis without sinus infection. This patient came to us nine years after the sinus graft with infection around the, the, the distal implant. There is no chance to maintain this implant. And what, what we have decided to do is to remove it. We remove the implant. This is the huge defect around the implant and we remove it. And then we correct the bone until we get some bone bleeding here. And that's it. And if we look at the CBCT some uh, one year later, there is a complete reconstruction of the defect. And if we, 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 we can eventually place the same implant in the same position. This is another case, the same situation. Here we have, this is not an acute infection. It does need, it is only a membrane reaction to the perimplantitis, but the osteum is, is open. So this is at the time of the diagnosis. We remove the implant. And now we clean the defect by curettage. That's it only. This is after three months, no more membrane information, but we can see that something is occurring and some healing is, is initiated here within the defect. This is after five months. And finally, after eight months. At that time, we have the opportunity to take a biopsy here in order to check the quality of the, the, the healing. 
We have two different areas within the, the area. We have the number one is this the previously grafted area. And the number two is the healing air, the health area. If we look at the biopsy, this is the grafted area and this is the health area. And if you look on a closer view, you can see that in the grafted area, we have still some uh, biomaterial remnants, but no biomaterial remnant in the regenerated area. This is confirmed with the histomorphometry. In the histomorphometry, you can see that we have no grafted material in the grafted in the regenerated area. So that means that there is no need to regraft this area after the uh, implant removal. All the cases we have like this, all of them, they behave in the same way with a complete regeneration of the defect. Now let's go to the more severe um, form with a sinus infection, acute sinus sinusitis due to perimplantitis. This is occurring 18 years after the sinus graft. You can see a, a complete infection of the sinus, a complete radiopacity of the sinus with the perimplantitis here. In that case, it is not very careful to remove the, it is not a good idea to remove the implant because the osteum is completely closed. And the risk is to get a neurotral communication exactly as for the natural teeth. So we do not remove the implant first. We perform an antrostomy here in order to drain the sinus, in order to reestablish a perfect osteopatency. And once this surgery has been performed, we can see that the situation is much better. And at that time, we remove the causal implant. And this is the defect resulting from the implant removing, removal and the periplantitis. And if we look after one year, this is a complete reconstruction of the defect. In that case, also we got a, an, 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 uh, a biopsy here. And looking at the biopsy, you can see two different areas exactly as in the same time with no more uh, bi uh, biomaterial remnants within the regenerated area. So even if we have an infection within the sinus, it is not necessary to graft. We have to wait, we have to be patient to wait the natural healing of the previously destroyed um, area. Now, the exception is the following. Look at this patient. This patient got a periplantitis with a sinus infection exactly as the previous one. But in that case, we have a discontinuity within the sinus floor. The implant is completely mobile. And because of the discontinuity of the sinus floor, it is impossible to get any bone reconstruction here. In that case, we perform the antrostomy, but after one year, no bone reconstruction. So in that case, if we want to place another implant, we will have to perform a new graft. Of course, we can ask ourselves the question, are patients with history of periplantitis bad candidates for sinus for elevation? Of course not. Look at this case. This patient was uh, affected by, by periplantitis in all, for all the implants she had. And of course, we had to remove those implants. And because of removing those implants, we had to perform sinus floor elevation bilaterally to place implant for a full arch restoration in the upper arch. And look at the result. After five years, it is perfectly stable. No more periplantitis. Periplantitis. Why? Because we had the opportunity to implement a very good prevention plans for 
this patient. The prevention is essential and it is consisting in different steps. First, before we decide to perform an implant, a, a sinograft on a patient presenting high risk factors for uh, peri-implantitis, we have to be sure this patient will comply to the maintenance program and for pre-op and post-op periodontal care. What is this pre-op and post-op periodontal care? First, we have to be sure the patient, after we perform the surgery, the sinus surgery, the patient should be able to clean the prosthesis. So we have to have a specially designed prosthesis for a good cleansability with very good spaces in order to use to, uh, brushes. We have to implement a supportive periodontal care after the uh, sinus surgery and the prosthesis uh, placement. And of course, we have to be able to manage the soft tissue problems which can occur afterwards. I mean, we have to be able to remove the prosthesis and the only way to remove the prosthesis in a very easy way is to use a screw retained prosthesis. Why? Because it is very easy to remove the prosthesis in order to manage the mucositis. As you know, mucositis is the only step of preimplant disease to be reversible. It is possible to manage mucos mucositis by removing the prosthesis in order to clean the abutments in order to, man to manage uh, the periplantitis, to disinfect the abutment surface and to eliminate all the inflammation. In order to prevent the soft tissue inflammation, I mean, mucositis is a good idea to augment the keratinous mucosa around the implants with frigidable grafts. Now the question is, do we have more preimplantitis in grafted sinus or compared to the native bone? This is a question, a very interesting question. Look at the, let's look at the literature. The literature, especially those systematic reviews of the literature, they say today the risk of preimplantitis is more or less the same in regenerated bone and in compared to the native bone. But, but for those um, papers, si augmented sinus are not included. So let's go to look at our studies. This is another study, a very interesting studies coming from Sweden, a very recent one, an animal studies. What it did, they uh, manage some experimental preimplantitis in um, in dogs with, and they they compare the, um, the evolution of preimplantitis in native bone without any bone augmentation and in augmented site. Augmented site are um, the essences which has been treated with GBR, and then the experimental uh, preimplantitis was applied on those implants. There was no differences regarding the prevalence when we compare the pristine size and the augmented size. But the difference is the following. Perimplantitis lesions were larger in augmented compared to the pristine size. That means that maybe, maybe because of the quality of, of, of because of the so, biomaterial remnants maybe the grafted area is less self-defending against the, uh, the bacterial uh, aggression. But this is only an hypothesis. If we look at our papers, we have very recent papers telling us that for um, grafted sinus, the marginal boss loss is increasing with time. And as you know, Perimplantitis is occurring very late, nine to 10 years after the surgery. 
Maybe there is a correlation, but today we are not sure about that. And if we look at a, sec a very recent paper by Stacky and co-workers, they say that maybe sinus elevation, especially performed with the one-stage procedure, is a risk factor for periplatitis. But we need much more evidence in the literature for this. But one thing which is sure, and we noticed for more than 10 years, is that periplantitis is a risk factor for implant failure in the grafted sinus. So it is very important to implement the right maintenance program and the right prevention program. And maybe we have one tool which is very interesting in order to prevent it, to identify uh, at risk patient for periplantitis is to use this tool, which was suggested last year by uh, Lisa Ismaifil from, from Australia with using the implant disease risk assessment. It is a very efficient tool. It is more or like less the same one, the same one as the one which was suggested by Tonetti for the, the susceptibility, susceptibility for periplantitis. It is the, the same one, but it is very efficient. So it's a good tool in order to identify at risk factor, at risk patient for periplantitis in grafted sinuses. In a more general way, we have to be very careful with remaining teeth. For example, all those teeth, this one with a big filling here, there is a risk of necrosis and, sorry, and the risk is to get an infection because of, of dental ne pulp necrosis for this tooth. And the same for the others. Here also, this tooth is very risky for the grafted, uh, if we graft this area. I would like to show you a case related to this topic, to this issue. Here we have a patient who underwent the sinus elevation with implant placement in 1992. She came back to us 12 years later like this. No more implants, no more bridge. And if we look at the intra uh, view, you can see that here we have a big uh, oral tract communication. So every time we have these kind of problems, the first thing is to look at the CBCT in order to identify the etiology of the complication. If we look at the cross-sectional cuts here, we can see here a very huge lacuna in the center of the graft. Same thing on the sagittal view, but if we look at the actual cut, you can see here, we have a track starting from this premolar going back to the grafted area. Maybe this tooth is the cause of the long-term infection. Because as you can see, this tooth was wearing a big core here and because of this big core, we got some root cracks for sure in during the time after the surgery, during the 12 years following the surgery. And through those cracks, we got some bacterial contamination creating a chronic infection of the graft. So of course, this tooth would have been extracted before the surgery and this implant would have been placed more anteriorly and for sure, by doing this, we will have, we will have no more uh, these uh, complication, long-term complications. Now, the second reason why we can have post-surgical alteration of sinus physiology are anatomical reasons. And the main one is the narrowing of the osteo because of anatomical reasons. This narrowing combined with the postoperative membrane inflammation will lead to a complete blockage of the osteum here, of the drainage. This, in order to reduce, to lower this risk, what we do every time we perform sinus surgery, we're using local corticoids in order to lower the risk of uh, the membrane, the, the inflammation process. And for this, we're using uh, 
two days before the surgery, two days before the surgery, and two weeks after the surgery, local steroids, bedazonid or mometazone. It is a nasal spray. Of course, we have specific anatomic variants which are resulting in a sinus stenosis. For example, the deviation of nasal septum, hyperpneumatization of the insunate process here, or hypertrophy of hollow cells, inverted convexity of the middle turbinate, we will see a case like this later, or enlarged ethmoid bulla. There is another situation which is called the concabulosa. Look at this case. This patient underwent a sinus surgery with implant placement simultaneously. She came back to us after 10 days with pain, fever, and edema. If we look at a CBCT, you can see that there is an undetected membrane perforation. Of course, the sinus is narrow. That means that this, the window for sure was too posterior, as we saw in the first part of my lecture. And because of those granules lost through the detective perforation and the presence of a concabulosa making the osseum very narrow, we got some, gran some granules blockage within the osteum, creating the acute sinusitis. In that case, we have to refer the patient very quickly to the ENT, and the ENT is performing first the turbinectomy, is removing the concabulosa, and then is opening the blocked osteum with this specific uh, surgical instrument. And look at the drainage, the pus is coming out in a very profuse, profuse way. And right now, we have the osteum is completely widened. And by you looking, looking inside the sinus, after washing the sinus with some antibiotics, you can see the confirmation, we, as we saw on the CBCT, some granule loss through the perforated membrane. And by doing this very quickly, we are able to maintain the graft and the implants. And this is the five year um, view. So the early diagnosis is really very, very important in order to manage these kind of complications. So the prevention, and this has to be decided by the ENT, is to remove the anatomic variant, making the risk of osteom narrowing very high. For example, here, the concabulosa, is removed preoperatively by the ENT. Right now, this last part is we can have post-surgical alteration of sinus physiology because of the patient health status, especially when the patient is suffering allergy or the patient is sneezing his nose or if he's blowing his nose or sneezing very often after the surgery, the risk is to have an elevation of the pressure within the sinus, pushing the graft outside the sinus cavity. A dislodgement of the graft can, can be the cause of an infection. Look at this case. This patient underwent a sinus surgery with implant placement two weeks in advance, and he came back to us with pain and fever. So immediately we perform the CBCT and the CBCT shows a bulla here, which is typical for sinus blowing. And here you can see the dislodgement. This bulla you can see, this bubble you can see here. Here we have a perforation and for sure we got some granule loss through the perforation the granules, they may, may migrate here within the sinus, within the osteum. And the osteum was very narrow because we had the inverted convexity of the middle turbinate make him, making the osteum very narrow. So immediately in that case, we'll refer the patient to the NT. He will remove 
the inverted uh, middle turbinate, but this was not enough to manage the infection. And immediately after we perform this surgery, you can see that this is the, uh, the turbinectomy which has been done. And here you have still some fistula, uh, fistula here remaining. So that means that the graft is still infected. So at that moment, we decide to raise the flap here in order to remove all the infected material as the implants, which were for sure contaminated. Yeah, we have very good bleeding, but the, the, the mobile part of the graft is maintained within the sinus. The implants are removed. And at that time, we have to disinfect this area by using a putty of doxycycline as suggested by this paper by Urban Irban, uh, by Urban Irban. And you can see we leave it during five minutes within in contact with the graft, then we wash it, and then we can cure it in order to get some good bleeding and the clotting in order to protect the area. And then we close the, the, the flap. Sorry. Sorry, this is I have a problem with the computer. So it is exactly the same. Huh? Okay, I'm sorry for this problem. Oh. Okay. This is a double pick, a double slide. I'm sorry. Okay, and this is after eight months. After eight months, this is the X-ray. We have to take a new CBCT in order to check the previously created area, and you can see anteriorly here is cut number one. We have enough bone to place an implant. In the center, it is not possible to place an implant. There is a big bone defect. Eventually, we can regraft it, but it is not necessary because we can place implant more posterior because these, the graft is intact. So that's exactly what we did here. This is the soft tissue in growth within the previously curated area. And now we can place implant in the remaining graft, which is able to, to support implants. And this is the five years follow-up. So by doing this, first by managing the, by, by reestablishing the sinus drainage, and then by disinfecting the graft with a local antibiotic, we were able to maintain both the graft and to place the implant. Now, we have another issue, which is very, very important to be discussed. Most of the time, when we have patients who are allergic with penicillin, it is re recommended in the literature to use, instead of penicillin, to use clindamycin as an antibiotic when we perform the surgery, the sinus surgery. But according to this paper, we can we know that clindamycin is not a very good idea because the risk of infection is very high when we're using clindamycin in patient allergic with penicillin. So the recommendation is to use those antibiotics. It is there are second generation quinolones. But the risk with uh, quino these kind of antibiotics is to get very serious problems with the Achille tendon. Sometimes we can get some rupture of the Achille tendon. Does it mean that patients who are allergic with penicillin are a contraindication for sinus graft? Of course, no. Why? Because 10% of the population claims to be allergic to the penicillin. 
but we don't have to believe these pa those patients. We have to ask them to underwent to undergo a, a test in order to detect the real allergy with penicillin. For this, we have many tests uh, available. And when we're using those tests, we will see that 90% of the patients claiming they are allergic to penicillin are not allergic. That means that the percent of patients really allergic to penicillin is very low. So for those patients, what should we use? A few years ago, I had the opportunity to participate in a, in a consensus conference discussing about the treatment of postoperative infection of uh, sinus surgery. And the conclusion was that in patients allergic with penicillin, it was a good idea to use instead of clindamycin, claritromycin or azithromycin in combination with metronidazole. And believe me, it is a very good solution. In case of complication, the only way will be to use second generation quinolones. But for this, we have to be in, that, in contact with the patient, the medical doctor or the ENT in order to be able to choose the right one in order to avoid the side effect with those uh, antibiotics. Another complication is this complication. It is a kind of osteonecrosis. This patient came to us after she was grafted by um, a colleague and in order to place the implants. And by checking the graft, we can see that the graft quality is not so good in the center of the graft. And we asked some more questions to the patient uh, because of course it was not possible to place implants in this situation. And we asked the patient if she was, she had any problem, medical problems. She says, no, I'm in perfect shape. The only way, the only thing I have to take, I, I'm taking is um, one pill per month because I'm suffering osteoporosis. And this patient was having an andronate, it is a bisphosphonate for eight years orally. And even taking, uh, when they are taken, um, taken orally, bisphosphonate could be a risk for grafting procedure. And if we look at the literature today, we start to have a consensus telling us that we have to be very careful with patients having bisphosphonates before, during uh, a long period. So today we do not graft these kind of patients. What about smokers? If we look at the literature, the main complication we can have for smokers is uh, dehiscence and the wound infection. So this is not a very good situation to be uh, managed. So today we do not graft uh, smoking patients. And, and you can see here on this long-term uh, study, the smoking group as an implant survival rate, which is much lower than the non-smoking group in this 20 year study. So right now it's time to conclude. And every time we have a patient to be grafted, to be sinus grafted, we have to first, before starting the surgery, we have to think about the risks by asking ourselves several questions. What about the sinus anatomy? Do we have, how is the membrane? Do we have septa? How is the alveolar artery? Is the maxillary sinus healthy or unhealthy? This is detected by looking at the pre-op CBCT, which is absolutely mandatory, and with the ENT consultation. Same thing for the risk of postoperative alteration of sinus physiology. And of course, we have to think about the patient medical history. As dentists, we are not able to answer all those questions. This is the reason why we have to implement a team approach 
with the patient medical doctor and the ENT in order to perform a right patient selection in order to lower the risk of, of complication and in order to improve, to increase the implant survival rate in grafted sinuses. So thank you very much for your attention. And now we can discuss your questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pascal, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Your videos were thank excellent. You your, your videos were excellent and your commentary was also equally e excellent. This shows us thank how you. good a teacher you are. So please accept our thanks first. And uh, if you allow, we'll, we have time for uh, two or three quick questions. So, yes, may, uh, yes sir. So actually, whatever questions we have received, you have given most of the answers uh, in your presentation itself, but still <clears throat> you can throw some more light on them. Uh, first question is how the approach is modified <clears throat> if there is full partition of sinus by a septum? So we, we, we have said them, uh, you know, uh, as I told you, we have two different possibilities. We can, depending on of the complexity of the internal anatomy, in case we have a very complex anatomy, what we do, as it was suggested in the paper, I was quoting the Japanese paper, what we do, first we go inside the sinus, we remove all the, the septa, the septa, even if we have a completely destroyed membrane, we don't care. We close the flap and thanks to the inflammation of the membrane after the tearing, we will get some healing process, a very efficient healing process, building, leading to some scar tissue formation. And thanks to this scar tissue, during the second surgery, six months later, we are able to detach the membrane without any tearing because the membrane is much more solid, okay? The other situation and is when we have only one septum in the middle, for example, um, a medial lateral septum. In case of medial lateral septum, we have two options. We can make two different sinus cavity, an anterior one and a posterior one, uh, anterior and posterior to the septum, and then we can consider we have two sinuses or what we can do, we can erode completely the, the buccal plate in order to isolate the medial lateral septum to cut it at the bottom. And then we detach the septum at the same time, at the same time we detach the membrane. We leave it attached to the membrane and we push it up and then we grab. We don't try to detach the septum from the membrane, okay? This is very important because most of the time when we try to detach it from the membrane, for sure we, get, we will get some big tearing. So two different situations according to the complexity of the internal anatomy. Wonderful, wonderful, sir. It has made it uh, very clear. And uh, very quickly, I will take one more question. You have told us that uh, overfilling of maxillary sinus can be uh, prevented uh, if we if the placement of the membrane is made rigid by uh, put, putting uh, titanium uh, pins or tacks but in case sir there is some overfilling of the uh, maxillary sinus can it be corrected you know overfilling of the mem of the sinus is very rare because the ostium is very very high is about 3 to 4 centimeters in height so it is really impossible to overfill the, the, the sinus, you know. Most of the time, we are limiting the graft volume because, because we are using very, uh, um, 10 millimeters implants in length, not more than this. So this is the reason why when we um, want to graft, we limit the graft volume. We don't, it, it, and you, we never overfill the sinus. It is impossible because First thing, it is very expensive because the biomaterial is very expensive. So, <laughs> of course, I'm joking, but uh, it is really impossible to overfill the sinus. It is impossible. Thank you so much, sir. Nivya, ma'am, would you like to ask something or I can ask one more question? Of course, of course. <clears throat> you can go ahead with another question. <laughs> Fine. 
thank thank you sir one uh, question we have received is how sinus perforation uh, how sinus membrane perforation is avoided <clears throat> sorry if we have to deal with a case which has a narrow angle say less than 30 degree angle between lateral and medial wall the, the only solution is to make the window as anterior as possible because as the most dangerous area is the narrow area of the sinus you know the risk is when we place the the the, the window too posterior the anterior part which is the most dangerous will be dissected blindly so the solution is to move the window very anterior as anterior as possible as close as possible the anterior wall of the sinus by doing this we will dissect the most dangerous area in direct view and when we dissect in direct view in case we have a perforation we will be able to manage it and it will not be the case in case the this the the dissection is done in a blind uh, in a blind way and we will not detect the perforation do you understand the difference exactly it is for the mem the window to be as anterior as possible yeah you sh you showed a wonderful video also uh, regarding that yeah we saw the video also uh and uh, i think sir one more question we have received if you allow yes. one more one more question uh, <clears throat> the question is how to manage intraosseous blood uh, vessel anastomosis that occur between infraorbital and posterior superior alveolar artery even when they have been detected in a cross section of ct scan so it is very difficult to manage it uh, predictably there is one way which is efficient but it's a bit risky is the um, uh, electrocoagulation with the bipolar device the problem is that we you can you can this um, perforate the membrane so this is the reason why i don't like this way to 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 manage the bleeding but be, believe me the most efficient way is to dissect the artery is to dissect the artery it is not very difficult to be done with only with piezo surgery it is a very efficient way to avoid the bleeding once the bleeding is occurring it will be very difficult to manage it in a very efficient way thank you so much sir i think madam closing remarks from your side so sir i just wanted <laughs> one thing is this uh, i i have been using piezo for last 20 years and uh, yeah. what do you say about this is it uh, possible to perforate the artery even with the piezo surgery or there is some uh, some prevention by piezo surgery yeah of course it is possible because the the risk with with uh, piezo surgery for perforation is to push the membrane to apply a white uh, i pressure with the instrument with the tips this is the reason why we have only to go tangential to with a very um, delicate um, movement we don't have to push the membrane because if you push the membrane with the piezo for sure you will you will uh, perforate it or or you can have a, push, a partial um, uh, tearing which is called delamination we you can create this with the piezo surgery sometime you know in in for the membrane it's not a guarantee piezo surgery is not a guarantee that like we have reduced the number of perforation with piezo surgery we have reduced it to 7% but that's not a guarantee that it will not happen no no we don't have any guarantee depend the way you are using the piezo surgery and also also of course the resistance of the membrane Uh, sometimes with the very thin membrane very thin very 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 thin it is impossible to avoid the surgery the the perforation sometimes for when we are joking we say it when we look at the the mem with the membrane we can perforate it in case it is very very um, fragile you know we cannot have any guarantee to do not perforate the membrane the most important thing is we know how to manage the perforation 
But the most different, the most difficult thing is to detect the perforation. This is the most, the most uh, difficult thing. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful presentation. You have actually expanded our vision for the treatment of such patients, and you have drawn our attention to things which we were not, which we used to take for granted. But uh, taking into consideration an ENT surgeon and looking very closely at the anatomy and the different structures related with that, you have really, it was an eye opener for us and wonderful cases, excellent presentation. And you have actually managed to uh, involve everything related with the uh, lateral sinus approach. Thank you so much, sir. It, would, it was you. a pleasure and uh, we look forward to having more lectures and more associations with you. Thank you, so Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. President. Have, Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye, sir. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. <clears throat> bye bye.